Yeah, we are live. Yeah, very good morning, all of you. I'm really sorry for the technical glitch from my side and there is some uh, issues with the internet as usual. So yeah, doesn't matter. So this is our, uh, uh, I would say, anti-penultimate session of the whole program. And today's, uh, uh, you know, the talk is, uh, uh, yes, uh, this is the, the main talk of the day. The two talks and um, Professor Anindita Padra is now going to talk today on um, dogs uh, in the urban ecology. So Professor Anindita Padra is working at ISER Kolkata and uh, she is working as Associate Dean and International Relationship at ISER Kolkata. Uh, Padra has done PhD from Center for Ecological Sciences at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore under the supervision of Professor Rakhavendra Gadakar. So as you might know that Ra Professor Rakhavendra is one of the most famous evolutionary biologists in the country. She has been working on free ranging dogs since joining the ISER Kolkata in June 2009. And uh, quite interested in, in uh, science communication, outreach and teaching theater and art. So there is a very interesting combination, Professor Badra. And I have seen uh, her YouTube channel along with her husband. Uh, they are doing a fantastic job on uh, different kinds of you know, the, the science, uh, science outreach through the drama as a medium, fantastic work. And of course, uh, Professor Anindita is a mother of two and the founding chair of INYAS, so Indian National Young Academy of Sciences, uh, uh, Professor Badra was the first chair. And in fact, it's actually the Professor Badra's initiative that has uh, ultimately uh, culminated in the formation of uh, INYAS, Indian National Young Academy of Sciences. And more than that, uh, Professor Badra is also a member of GYA. That is, a, you know, that is something like a mother uh, association for all of these national young academies. So this is GYA is uh, nothing but Global Young Academy, one of the most prestigious young academies and in which she is also currently a member of the executive committee. So it's a body of the GYA and uh, Professor Badra has done, uh, has got INSA Young Scientist Award, Women Excellence Award and IAP Young Scientist Award as well. So uh, to add on something uh, on the uh, Professor Badra, actually, you know, many of her research have been featured in uh, uh, you know, in many of the interesting media out outlets, including the BBC. And uh, she has been doing the po science popularization. She's very active in Bengali medium, along with, uh, 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 you know, the Dr. Ajian Banerjee, her husband. And uh, he's, uh, he's working in physics department of ISO Kolkata. And they have something called Mukosh Theater in the YouTube. And uh, Professor Badra is also active in Inside COVID, that is Indian Scientist Response to the COVID team, that is ISRC especially uh, the team, I'm also a member of this ISRC and we are actually involved with myth busting mostly, uh, you know, most of the myths uh, in, in India. And we are, uh, yes, so as you can see here in the screen, the, her uh, recent research on the, uh, you know, the selfishness of the dog mothers don't share their food with the pup. So that is a very interesting story, has been featured in the BBC Earth. So Professor Bhadra, uh, I, I warmly welcome you to this, uh, you know, the, the Tangled Bank, this uh, sm a small initiative from INIAS as well as UP side. And yes, over to you, madam. Thank you, Felix, for the very warm introduction and uh, for the invitation to come and uh, speak in this fantastic workshop. You had a host of excellent speakers most of them my friends and uh, it was nice following the talks i've been enjoying them on youtube thank you for the initiative and it's a special pleasure because enias is one of the hosting organizations for this uh, initiative and enias is some of course an organization very close to my heart so uh, we're running late i will uh, start sharing my screen which again might take a minute or so so let me uh, 
doesn't give me the share screen option. There's a blue icon uh, below, share screen. It's not coming for some reason. Just a minute. Yes, yes, absolutely. You can make it full screen and yeah. Yes, so uh, good morning, everyone, whoever is listening. And uh, again, thanks to Felix for uh, inviting me to this very, very interesting symposium, The Tangled Bank. Uh, you can see the title of my presentation here today is Probing into the Private Lives of the Street Dogs in India. So today is World Environment Day and a special pleasure speaking on this day. This year, the theme of the World Environment Day is biodiversity and its importance. So this symposium, this workshop that Felix has been organizing is especially relevant today, given the theme, given the number of topics that we have been covering. So when we think of biodiversity, uh, the, I've put up the definition given by the United Nations Environment Program, the UNEP, which has described biodiversity as the variety of life on Earth, which includes all organisms, species, populations, the genetic variation among these, and their complex assemblages of communities and ecosystems. Now, when we think of biodiversity, if you ask any lay person on the street, the person might be thinking of various kinds of habitats, which could be a forest, a desert, uh, coral reefs, or even uh, you know the alpine regions, but then most people do not count, connect the word biodiversity with an image like this, that of a city. Now, do we have biodiversity in urban landscapes? The answer, simple answer to that question is yes. Look around yourself. Even the most polluted, the non-green cities around the world have some form of life or the other. All the images that you see here are taken from my window during the lockdown. So these are images just around me. I live in a small town, but even if you're living in a big town, uh, even uh, the very polluted Delhi, you're going to see all or some of these life forms around you. Of course, the most obvious life form among uh, all are the humans. But though we think that we are very important, we are not necessarily the most important life form on Earth. Uh, live along the cities. Scavengers play a very, very important role in urban ecosystems. In India, you would see scavengers in the forms of uh, dogs, crows, cows, goats, minas. And there are some places uh, like the US where even bears can be scavengers. So what is an ecosystem? Simply a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. So any space on earth where you have an environment and there are living systems, it can form an ecosystem. But then the question is, why do we care? Here, I would urge you to think. This image that I showed you two slides back of the sunflower with the honeybee uh, foraging for nectar on it, and then there's a caterpillar feeding on the sunflower. All of these are connected. So all life forms that you see in an ecosystem have some relationship with each other. They might be competing for the same resources. They might be prey predators. They might be hosts and parasites. There are different kinds of relationships and it forms a tangled bank, even if you are living in a city. So I'm an ecologist or a behavioral biologist. So an ecologist is someone who studies animal behavior. We try to understand uh, questions like how animals or plants or microorganisms survive and live and why they do so. This is an image that does not need an introduction today. This tiny, tiny particle, not even a living organism, it's living as well as non-living because it's a virus, 
particle size of 120 nanometers approximately. And this is something that's driving us all crazy. I'm sitting at home and giving, giving you this webinar because of this uh, tiny particle. I'm not in my classroom. I'm not delivering a talk in a physical seminar room. And then in the news, you are going to come across all kinds of information about how to treat the virus, how we can deal with it, how to stay safe, uh, how to, to you know, handle patients, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Felix just mentioned the ISRC, Indian Scientist Response to COVID, where we try to put up hoaxbusters, mythbusters, do's and don'ts of all kinds for the general public. One thing I would ask you to ponder about is all of this, understanding of how to deal with the virus and how to fight it comes from understanding the behavior of the virus. We are of course doing a lot of research in trying to get medicines and vaccines, trying to find out how the virus works, what's the physiology, what is the biochemistry, what is the molecular level mechanism. But at the end of the day, to control the virus, we need to understand how the virus behaves. So Behavioral biology is very important, be it plants, be it animals, be it microorganisms. I have a lab in Isaac Kolkata, which we call the dog lab. And in the dog lab, we are a set of crazy people who like to roam around on streets with notebooks and sometimes cameras, probing into the private lives of dogs. That's what we do. We study street dogs in India. Now, whenever I say I work on dogs, uh, I work on dogs only in urban, spaces, sometimes in rural areas, but primarily urban dogs. I would like you to realize that these are animals which are present in all kinds of human habitats. You take a uh, walk outside, you'll see a dog, you go to a village, you'll see dogs, you go to the most crowded parts of the city, you'll see dogs, you go out in the Himalayas, you're going to see dogs. These animals are primarily scavengers, though of course, many humans feed them, but they typically don't hunt in urban spaces. Though they are capable of hunting, there are enough reports of dogs forming large packs, hunting down wildlife, and there is a lot of discussion, some research going on, on dog wildlife conflict. They largely depend on us for foods. They go and scavenge in dustbins. All of us know about that. They live in small to medium groups. Uh, they have a lot of interactions among themselves and with humans. I'm going to talk a bit in detail about these. And technically they are known as the free ranging dogs, though we call them street dogs, feral dogs, streeties, indies, so on and so forth. When I say dogs, people ask me, which breed of dogs do you work on? And the images you see here are of course pet dogs. And worldwide, there is a lot of research going on in understanding the cognitive abilities, the behavior of pet dogs, because we know that Dogs and humans have a very, very special relationship. And if you look at the evolutionary history of dogs, dogs have emerged or evolved from wolves or wolf-like ancestors, undergone a process of domestication with humans and eventually become the pet dogs that we know of today. However, if you look at the numbers, 70 to 80% of the dog population of the world comprises of not the pets which live in human homes, but free ranging dogs which live on streets. And these free ranging dogs probably represent an earlier condition of domestication when we hadn't yet taken the dogs home, but were still interacting with them and they were hanging around our settlements as scavengers. If you look at the world map, then majority of the countries that belong to the world's global south have free ranging dogs. So they are really an important part of the human ecosystem. Of course, with humans in India, we know they have a love-hate relationship. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that in India, as in many African countries, we have a huge burden of rabies. No matter how much we love dogs, we cannot brush this aside because we know that rabies is a real world problem that we have to deal with. For me, a very interesting phenomena, which has made it to the news a couple of years back, this image of a dog which followed uh, people up to the peak of the, the Himalayas, to the Himalayan summit in an expedition. This is not a pet. This is just a stray dog which followed uh, the climbers and went up to the peak. 
this always reminds me of another story, which is this. Uh, every Indian knows the story of the Mahabharata and how it ends. So there is this dog, uh, which followed the Pandavas and he, the dog and Yudhishthira were the two final individuals who made it to heaven, whatever that is. So this uh, uh, image is very important to me or the story is very important to me because this shows us a very, very, very basic nature of dogs. They follow humans around and sometimes they get into trouble because of this, because they exceed their territorial boundaries in following a certain human being. Again, why do we care about dogs? Why do we care to study them? Because they're an interesting model system for evolution. Uh, they have a long shared history with humans as a species. And in India, they have existed as natural populations in very similar conditions for centuries. Imagine the dogs in Indian streets have uh, overcome the problem of humans on feet to humans on horses to humans on carts to humans on uh, two wheelers and four wheelers. All of that they have gone through along with us. And of course, there are many situations of conflict on Indian streets. And in order to reduce conflict, just like to handle the coronavirus, we need to understand its behavior. Similarly, in order to reduce conflict between dogs and humans, we need to understand the behavior and ecology of free ranging dogs in India. So what do we do? We work on various aspects of dogs. We look at their interactions with each other, be it in terms of mating, parental care, interactions between siblings, territorial interactions or competition. Uh, we look at how they interact with humans, uh, humans as resources and threats, and how smart they are, their various cognitive abilities to perform certain tasks. I'm not going to, of course, tell you all that we have been doing in the last almost 11 years that I've been working on dogs now, but I'm going to give you a brief glimpse of the kind of uh, understanding we have developed of free ranging dogs from our work. So if I try to look at how a puppy eventually grows up into a dog and in the process has to survive in what I call the human jungle, then it undergoes a lot of complex interactions with dogs and with humans. Uh, so with dogs, it'll have social interactions. It'll have parental care from the mother, alloparental care, interactions in terms of uh, play with its siblings, sibling rivalry, mating dynamics, territorial behavior, group dynamics of various kinds, and foraging activities. With humans, there will be social communication, the ability to manipulate and maneuver human artifacts, and there would, of course, be a big factor of human perception of dogs and how they manage that. If you look at pup occurrence in the population, because that's a very important question, when uh, are pups born? When do we see them? So our results say that pup occurrence kind of peaks in the months of Jan December, January, which is the peak of winter, winter, uh, winter in India. Uh, so they come around, uh, start appearing from October, but then majority of births happen in December, January, and then this kind of tapers off. Now, even in this window, if you look at it, it's not just births, but birth and growth and also deaths, which are happening. Now, pups are typically given uh, birth to by their mothers inside dens. They can be natural holes or, uh, you know, some human artifact that they have found. And we have done a very, very extensive study to check out what kind of spaces dogs utilize as dens. And they pretty much utilize every space available. And in spite of that, we see certain preferences for kind of dens that mothers use. And we have found that they kind, uh, they kind of try to then close to humans so that they are close to resources. And uh, mothers with uh, smaller litters seem to be more choosy about where they den rather than mothers with bigger litters. Uh, this is an overview of uh, the uh, graph which gives you a cause relationship between the size of the litter, uh, the den score, which is various characteristics put together. I'm not going into the detail and the numbers. And if I uh, break down this uh, graph into simpler details, then this is what I just showed you, told you that they want to have uh, resources close to their dens and the resources in terms of food and water. And uh, humans play an important role. They seem to prefer to den close to humans, which is contrary to all other urban species, which try to den away from humans. 
and mothers, we have done a separate study to show that pregnant females actually go from one place to another, select and reject dens until they find the one which is optimum for them. So parental care by the mother or the maternal care starts at the level of den selection. And then uh, as the pups grow, this graph shows you the age of pups and weeds starting from the third week because in the first two weeks, the mother is called up with the pups inside the den and she doesn't let anyone to uh, go even close by. Uh, and we didn't want to disturb them. So we only observed them from the third week up to the 17th week, uh, which is when the pups have uh, become matured into juveniles and they're not really being cared for by the mothers anymore. And if you look at the different distributions of color, uh, then you see the pink, which is suckling or nursing, which is much higher in the beginning and then goes down and then other kinds of behaviors. So the mother is not just nursing the pup. She's also licking them clean. She's eating fecal matter to clean the den. She's playing with them. She's protecting them from intruders. All kinds of behaviors that the mother puts in spends a considerable amount of her, of her time in the day taking care of her pups actively. Now, you must have seen images like this or you know, instances like this. When you see that the mother, who is obviously a lactating female, is being chased by her puppies and she is refusing to nurse them, she is running away from them. Now, often I have seen people say, oh, what a horrible mother she is. She is not caring for her puppies. She is not allowing them to feed on her milk. Why is she doing this? So why do the mothers refuse to nurse? This was a standard question that we asked. And we found when we looked in detail at the suckling or nursing behavior, we saw that as the pups grow older, the mother's rate of nursing goes down and completely stops when the pups are 14, 15 weeks old. Now, this makes a lot of sense. We found that from the eighth week onwards, the mothers start the process of weaning when she will start refusing nursing bouts and the pups will keep chasing her until the 14th week when the pups stop chasing her altogether, when they start becoming independent of the mother's milk. This is a very, very important phase in the development of all mammalian babies, be it dogs, be it uh, horses, be it humans, doesn't matter. And this is why the mother starts refusal because she's starting the process of weaning. We also found something very interesting that dogs, as I said, they live in small to medium groups and often there are multiple females in a group which are giving birth in the same season. There are overlapping litters. And we saw that uh, other adult group members also show care to the pups. So we call this alloparental care when it's not a parent who's caring. So anyone other than the mother showing care to the pups was considered an alloparent. And we saw that grandmothers, older siblings, aunts, and sometimes a few males, sometimes belonging to the group, sometimes even belonging to a neighboring group who would come and show care to the pups. They would come and lick the pups, groom the pups, play with them, protect them. Especially for the females, whom we call, uh, especially for the males, I'm sorry, whom we call the putative fathers because these are multiply mating animals. We don't know who the real father is. So we call them putative fathers, males who are giving care. And we found that males also show a lot of different types of care. So if this is the same graph that I showed you two slides back of the mother's distribution of care, and here is the father's distribution of care, where he is showing a lot of protective behavior, which is the pink bars. Uh, he's uh, showing some piling up and sleeping with the pups, which is again a protection. Uh, the black ones is clean. And when we looked at the differences between the males and the females, the primary difference in the type of care given by the males and females that we found is while mothers are spending most of their time in feeding, fathers are spending most of their time in play. When we looked at the interactions between the siblings, this looks like a very complicated graph, but the bottom line of the graph is that the mothers did not keep on increasing their amount of care as the uh, litter sizes increased. So mothers would reach saturation in how much care they can show after a point. So a litter of four and a litter of eight will not show, you know, double the amount of care by the mothers. So obviously, since the mother's care saturates, the more the pups she has, each pup would receive lesser and lesser care depending on how many siblings it has. So for the pups, it was advantageous to have lesser siblings. And of course, when there are more siblings, 
they are competing with each other for the mother's care, for the mother's milk, and this is what gives rise to sibling rivalry. But siblings are not only fighting, just like siblings in any other species, they are playing a lot. So this is a network of interactions showing only play behavior. All the blue circles are pups, and the size of the circle shows how much each pup plays. And uh, the smaller circles are adults in the group of different kinds. Again, I'm not going into the details of it, but the bottom line is that pups seem to develop a social bonding, just, not just with their siblings, but also with non sib pups in the group through play. In other mammalian species, there have been extensive studies which show that play in early life is uh, providing the baseline for uh, future social bonding and interactions. So these relationships that they develop in early life are likely to define future relationships within the group. Now, if I look at the part, uh, timeline of development of the puppies, they begin with receiving high levels of maternal care between their third, you know, up to their seventh week of age. Seven to eight, thirteenth week is the period of parent offspring conflict when the mother is trying to wean them off and the pups are still demanding care. Beyond the 13 weeks, it is mostly passive maternal care. And after 16 weeks, uh, they are pretty much independent. At four weeks, they kind of mature into juveniles and they are uh, matured as juveniles and they're starting to forage and uh, go around on their own. Seven months is typically when they attain sexual maturity. We looked at mortality and we found that uh, as mortality increases with pup age, the highest level of mortality is at four months. Remember, this is also when they are becoming pretty much independent of the mothers. We looked at the various causes of mortality and unfortunately, humans were found to be the biggest source of mortality for the pups. Uh, so summing it up, uh, survival up to seven months, which is on sexual maturity, only 19% of the pups born in the population survive. So when around you, people say there are too many puppies around, please tell them the next time, don't worry, 80% of them are going to die anyway. They're not going to survive forever. Human-induced mortality is 63%, so we are their biggest predators. And the highest rate of mortality, as I mentioned, occurs in the fourth month of age. And the first month, which is when they are completely under the care of the mothers, actually has the lowest mortality, which shows that the natural mortality by early disease and death is pretty much low. So, Pups receive external, uh, extensive care from the mothers up to the age of four months. They have various levels of interactions with their group members, adults, pups, both taken together. They learn to forage from adults and they're highly efficient scavengers. I'm not showing you data for this experiment. Early social life is known to influence personalities in many other species, and it is likely to do so in the dogs too. Now, I would urge all dog lovers out there, the next time you see a puppy and want to take it home, think twice. Are you taking it away from its family, its home, and making it lose its early life learning from its group members? And are you depriving it from its natural social life? I understand we are dog lovers who want to protect the dogs, but also we need to understand that they have a life of their own and the streets are really their home where they lead a very, very complex social life. I will shift gears and talk about a bit about our findings about how efficient dogs are as scavengers. We know that, that they are not the only scavengers in India. There are pigs, there are cows, there are crows, there are miners, there are goats, cats, rats, all kinds of scavengers that they are competing with. And we try to ask the question that are they going to just eat anything that they find or can they afford to be choosy because we know that they come from an ancestry of meat eaters they are supposed to be picky about their food and they're supposed to prefer meat but do they have the luxury of being choosy so we did what we call the dustbin simulation experiment and we literally simulated this situation where you have three baskets which act as dustbins in which uh, the students put in uh, three kinds of, uh, you know, three kinds of dustbins. So the one box had raw meat, uh, 10 pieces, 
Another box had five pieces of raw meat, chicken in all cases, and bread, five pieces. And the third box had just 10 pieces of bread. So you can make out one box is rich in meat. Another box has some meat, but some carbs. The third has no meat. And all of them have a lot of garbage, which have been picked up from the streets and dumped into the box. And we gave this setup to dogs, and we tried to find out how they're going to eat within a time of one minute. So they're constrained for time. Uh, 96 adults were tested for this experiment and the primary result shows that dogs prefer to eat from the protein box the most. They sniff all the boxes and then they go and eat this, eat from the protein box when you are give, doing this experiment with individual dogs. And there was uh, no difference between the sniffing of the boxes, but the difference only came from the eating. Uh, they showed a clear preference for meat over the other two categories. And when we looked at overall number of pieces eaten, considering all the boxes, meat was eaten the most. And uh, this was not only from the protein rich box, but also from the mixed box. So they were definitely selective in their foraging. As a follow up of this experiment, we have done this with different setups where we have increased competition by giving the same setup to a group of dogs and by giving a single box with food and garbage mixed together to a group of dogs and we are going to soon have the results. So adults showed a clear preference for meat over carbs during scratching, shows, showing how efficient they can be. In a different set of experiments, we actually found that pups and juveniles do not show this preference. They pretty much eat whatever you give, give them. And we found in a third set of experiments that dogs use something we call a rule of thumb, which is simply as, something as simple as if it smells like meat, eat it. So anything you give them which is laced with the smell of meat, they're going to eat that first. Now, pet dogs, we know, uh, have what we call in the literature as socio-cognitive abilities. They can communicate with you, they can make eye contact with you, they can follow your pointing gestures, and that is what makes pets communicate with humans so well. So we wanted to understand how good uh, dogs are at socio-cognitive abilities if they don't have training, if they have not been bred and read by humans, unlike the pet dogs. So what is their innate ability in communicating with humans? And we did a series of experiments in which we tested whether dogs can follow a gesture as simple as this, where you bend down and point to a box, will the dog go to this? And when we did this with adults, uh, juveniles and puppies, we found that pups, readily follow pointing. 89% of the pups in our experiment went to the box pointed at. Remember, if you see the images here, all of them are covered in the beginning, so they don't know which one has food. And the empty bowl is actually rubbed with a piece of meat, so both of them smell the same. So the only cue here is the pointing. The puppies do this. Adults and juveniles typically show a 50-50 response. Mostly juveniles will typically go to the box that you don't point at more often than the adults. Interesting thing was with the adults, we, we, with all of them, we did three trials each. With adults only, we found something very interesting. When you point, the adult has the possibility of either following or not following. When they follow a point and get a reward, then in the next trial, the chances of them following the pointing increases. But when they follow a point and do not get a reward, the chances of following a point reduces. So this is positive reinforcement, there is negative reinforcement, which means that the pups are actually, uh, the adults are actually making a decision about reliability of the humans based on their immediate experience with this human, which is very interesting because pet dogs don't seem to have this ability at all. Uh, we also tested them with more complex pointing gestures where you point uh, momentarily and take your finger away, or you point from a very long distance, not very close up to the bowl. And we saw one is called a dynamic cue, the other is called a momentary cue. And we saw in both cases, almost 80% of the dogs followed this pointing as compared to the previous experiment, which was about 60%. Uh, interesting thing is that in the previous experiment, the experimenter was bending low and bringing its face very close to the dog. Whereas in these two experiments, the gesture was more complex as far as humans are concerned because we either gave a very short pointing 
or we get gave a distant point name, but we were farther away from the dock. And looks like the fear factor comes into play when you bend low and your face is close up to the dog, the dogs are more reluctant to approach. And this experiment actually concluded that dogs, even in spite of not having any training at all, are capable of following subtle and complex human gestures like pointing. Uh, we were actually not too thrilled with this because from our experience with street dogs, we kind of expected this result, but it was a big surprise for us when uh, it uh, seemed like uh, for one week, all the important uh, scientific uh, medium as well as the public media were covering this as huge news uh, because the pet dog, uh, people used to pet dogs found this to be extremely surprising. So summing it up, free-ranging dogs readily follow human pointing, uh, uh, by pointing gestures given by unknown humans as pups. As juveniles, they are more reluctant. As adults, they show positive as well as negative reinforcement. And adults are even capable of following complex and subtle cues. Second uh, level of experiment is trying to understand how well they understand gestures uh, by humans like a friendly gesture where you bend a bit and call out to them, a low impact threat where you just raise a hand, and a high impact threat where you raise a hand carrying a stick. Of course, you don't actually harm the animals, but just show them these gestures. And then after each of these, you offer them food. And we wanted to see in the first set is called the social cue phase, and the second set is called the food provisioning phase. After this, how many dogs would approach? This is a very complex looking graph, but the bottom line of this is, that dogs will uh, actually showed very high response when it came to the friendly cue, lower response for the threatening cues. But while in the low threat cue, they responded when they were given food, in the high threat condition, they did not come to us even when we offered food. So this showed that they can understand intentions and the same dog can respond to different intentions very clearly, even when it is the same experimenter giving these different cues to them. This is my favorite experiment. We wanted to test how dogs build trust. From the pet dog literature, the understanding has been that dogs have befriended humans for food, and then we have become attached to them and we have had emotional attachment. So we actually did an experiment where we offered food to the pups with one piece of food in the hand, one piece of food on the road, and we tried to see whether the dog will feed from the hand. And let me tell you, initially all dogs tested Majority of them did not come and feed from the hand. They came and ate, ate the food from the road. Now, a set of dogs were given only the food and a set of dogs were given picking and then tested for their response. In a long-term test, when we gave them food uh, over different days and tested their response to eating from the hand, this is called what is known as the food reward experiment. Uh, if you see here, these are all mostly crosses. The dots are the positive responses of eating from the hand. So with the food reward, the dogs did not seem to befriend the human even after a 15 day period of exposure. Whereas dogs which were just petted on the head and not given food uh, and tested for this showed a big change. You can just see the difference here. The number of dogs which started eating from the hand on day one, there were only seven. And immediately after the next day onwards, this became 15 and they remained at this with some more increases. So with the social reward, the dogs were more prone to coming and getting attached to the experiment. So free ranging dogs do not trust unfamiliar humans. They don't take food from the hand immediately, but they preferentially rely on humans who show them love rather than those who provide them food on repeated interactions. Now this is very adaptive because we know of cases where people call them give them food and this food happens to be poisoned. So if dogs are building trust based on social reward rather than food reward, their chances of being fooled are lower. So this seems to be an adaptive trait in survival in the human dominated environment for the dogs. My last set of uh, slides would be to answer the question, how do we humans influence dog behavior? Uh, if you look at the images here, there are uh, a pair showing very highly crowded places, the first being a railway station, the second being a market. 
but this is a zone of high human flux. So a lot of people. The next is an intermediate uh, human flux zone, typically neighborhoods with sh some shops uh, around, and then a low human flux zone, which are completely residential areas. And we tried to test how friendly or how approachable dogs in the three kinds of areas are. And what we found is that uh, if you look at the tendency of free ranging dogs to approach an unfamiliar human, this is very different in the three zones. In the intermediate zo flux zone, the dogs are the boldest and uh, they are also the friendliest. The ones in the high human flux zone will approach when you give them food, but not approach when you call them. The dogs in the low human flux zones will hardly ever approach. Now, this is a study that we are very happy with. This is the first study where anybody has tried to understand how the animal's experiences of interactions with humans in its environment might actually influence its response to humans. And we are carrying out, carrying out further studies to understand their behavioral differences in these zones, because this is what is helping us understand how our behavior might be influencing the behavior and the personalities of the dogs. Now connected to this is what I'm ending with, a big question of how do you think the lockdown has affected dogs? Because just now I said that human flux influences dog behavior. And then during the lockdown, there were suddenly no humans, no vehicles on the road and no food in many areas. So I would expect that the dogs in neighborhoods would hardly be affected, but the dogs in high flux zones and even intermediate flux zones would be the ones which would be affected by the lockdown. And this is the kind of question that we've been asking. Of course, there have been a lot of uh, uh, good Samaritans who have gone around feeding dogs, but then how would the lockdown have affected dynamics of social behavior because suddenly there would be pockets in which there would be feeders with a lot of food and there would be pockets which would be devoid of food. Have the dogs migrated? Have they been fighting more among each other? And then now when the lockdown is going off and people are back on the road, how do we expect dogs to react to this change? In trying to understand this, of course, we could not go out and do observations on the streets because it was lockdown time. So we uh, seeked help from people around us. We started a citizen science initiative, which we called Bonkers Scavengers. And the idea was anyone who no is noticing dogs around their house can take videos and send them to us with this hashtag. And we are also running a survey for people to answer. It's a longish survey with uh, various observations on dog behavior, uh, where uh, people can answer this survey. You can visit our dog lab homepage or you can visit our Facebook page and get the link to the survey. And you can share any videos of scavengers, not just dogs, but cows, monkeys, and any other scavengers you've been noticing around you, which you think are behaving differently from other times. This is what we are trying to collect through a citizen science project. And we hope we are going to get some insights into how the lockdown has affected the behavior of scavengers. So take home messages from all that I have said. Free ranging dogs are a very, very important part of our ecosystem and we of theirs. Uh, they have very complex social lives of their own. They are highly efficient as scavengers, well adapted to understanding and communicating with humans. And we know of studies where uh, people in pet, uh, working on pets have shown how well they are at making eye contact and begging from us. And they have even figured out the evolutionary reason of this behavior. Uh, we humans are an important component in the ecology of dogs, and we have a significant influence on their behavior. So I would end with a question to all the viewers. Can we interact with the dogs a little more responsibly? I would like to end by thanking all the viewers uh, for listening. UPP and Enias for hosting this fantastic workshop. Special time thanks to my friend Felix. I put up his picture with this background on purpose because I wanted to highlight that Felix is an avid science outreach person. He runs a YouTube channel called Curiosity. If you haven't checked it out yet, please go do it now. It's fantastic. Uh, thanks to all the funders uh, who have been supporting this work for the last 10 years. All members of the Dog Lab, not only my PhD and MS students, but a core of summer students who have been working with us over the years, making all of this work possible. 
uh, all members of the behavior and ecology lab group in Isaac Kolkata and of course Isaac Kolkata which has been supporting the work all of these years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Anindita. It was really wonderful. And uh, yes, we had a, a sneak peek through to the private life of the street dogs of India. It's amazing. And uh, yes, we a lot of things that really eye opener, especially like, you know, the, the yes, so uh, the dogs don't really care about the food, but more about our care, you know, the, the human care and uh, yes, the empathy that matters a lot. So that's amazing finding and a lot of things that you actually revealed today. So thank you so much for this. And we have a lot of questions from the viewers. Uh, well over 300 people are right now watching and yeah, it, it goes up to two, 2K uh, viewers typically. So uh, yeah, thanks for a lot uh, from my viewers as well. A lot of uh, questions are really flooding in. One of the questions is by uh, Mr. Raj Kumar from Madhya Pradesh. He's asking, is it possible to train dogs to check COVID-19 positive persons just by smell? <laughs> That's quite a strange question, but Interesting yeah. Interesting question, actually, I would say, because uh, we know that uh, there have been studies where people have shown that dogs can sniff out cancer, and they oh, are okay. actually better at detecting some kinds of cancer, like colorectal cancer. They do better than tests. I had actually written a review of this in Current Science a long time back when I started working on dogs. So people, uh, there are there is an evidence that dogs are good at sniffing out disease, whether they can sniff COVID-19 is something that we don't know. Now you have to also understand the problem that they are uh, typically, if you want a dog to be you know, sniffing at the people and getting the uh, disease identified, the person needs to be okay with that, right? So this is always a problem that when you really want uh, patients to be sniffed, all not all patients like being sniffed by a dog. So there are these issues. So uh, answer is we don't know because nobody has really tested it. But uh, there is evidence that dogs are sometimes better at detecting some diseases, even better than diagnostic tests, which sometimes only can work at later stages of cancer, but dogs can do early detections. This is known. So uh, thank you, Anidita, for such a nice talk. And it is really very day-to-day -day life activities, actually. Dogs are present all around us and uh, in the different uh, habitats. So the observation, critical observation, and to investigate the socio uh, behavior of these uh, social animals is really appreciable. It is something really unique as compared to all other traditional sciences. So my question is, uh, as you asked about the disease, so uh, what are the major disease we are for the dogs? So, and how could we take care of those? Uh, how could we identify this disease in the dogs is really serious and this disease is ignorable. So on the basis of that, rabies is one of them actually. So we know rabies and uh, may you explain the symptoms of the rabies and other disease which are very harmful. Yeah, you can say injurious. Yeah, you can say harmful for the dogs. And I also heard about the cancer in the dogs. So may you enlighten those issues? Yeah. yeah. Uh, firstly, let me uh, tell you that I am not a vet. So whenever there is disease, I don't go identify it because I'm not trained to do it. But from my experience, I can tell you, yes, how do you identify rabies, frothing in the mouth, uh, uh, unnatural, uh, uh, you know, jerky behavior, trying to chase people, bite people. All of these are standard signs of rabies. Um, very rarely, as of now, we have had one case of a rabid dog on our campus uh, very recently. And uh, we suspect that uh, the source was either uh, monkeys or jackals around. Uh, other than that, I have never really seen a rabid dog until now. Just one. Um, other, yes, dogs do get cancer. In fact, right in my uh, house, we have a family of dogs which lives in our garden and the mother had got cancer. We actually got a vet who came and cured her. And after that, the mother actually, uh, th this female actually gave birth this year. So do, they do get cancer. I mean, they are mammals and they get, get all the diseases that uh, mammals can get. Uh, there are thankfully several uh, vaccines available for dogs. So uh, for that matter, there is a coronavirus which affects dogs and gives them uh, 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 especially uh, digestive tract related ailments and there is actually a vaccine for that. So pet dogs are given coronavirus uh, vaccine. 
but this is not the novel coronavirus again. Uh, so uh, there are, there are of course various zoonotic diseases that dogs can pass on to humans. And that is why when we are interacting with uh, free ranging dogs, we have to be careful. I always tell people don't touch them if you can avoid it and they don't always welcome your touch. So as long as you're not touching them, not going very close by, they should be safe. But of course, when it's a rabid dog, we have to be more careful and a rabid dog is uh, a rabid dog. It has to be put down. And uh, there are, this is the problem, you know, when we identify a dog with disease, uh, this is uh, something again, I'm treading on um, uncomfortable territory because from a behavioral ecologist perspective, I often tell people if a dog is very ill, let it be, it is not going to survive and it is not meant to survive. And that is what keeps the population under check. If we want to give treatment to every sick dog on the road, we are again going to have more conflict because there are going to be too many dogs and we cannot manage that. So with puppies, they get worms a lot and often they die because of worms. So if you see a very healthy swollen uh, puppy, it is not really healthy. It is most likely it has a lot of worms in its tummy. And those puppies typically don't survive until they are given vaccines against worms and then taken care of. And then of course you are going to tweak this balance of 80% mortality, which is again going to affect them in the long term because there are going to be more accidents, there are going to be more humans beating them up, all of these questions. Yes, uh, and it's a very interesting uh, discussion going on. And um, a number of uh, answers, actually, the questions, answers you have already been covered. For example, many of them are asking about the zoonotic diseases and uh, do the dog spread the zoonosis. So all these things we have already covered. And I also want to mention a name. Purva Srivastava's question is about the dog securely sniffing out cancer, which you have just discussed about it. Now that we have a question coming from Kiran NS, BSc Biotechnology at Reva University in Bangalore. And he's saying, a saying in our village is that dogs whiskers help them to see in the dark. Is it true? If yes, what kind of principle the phenomena is involved in such mechanics? I've never heard this, but it's a very interesting question. Yes. I would imagine whiskers help them to smell in the dark. Okay. And uh, if smelling is seeing that, then yes, because they can sniff out things very easily. But again, with dogs really sniff out using their wet nose and that is their biggest weapon. So there is another question from my side, Anindita. Yeah. You use the word free ranging dogs, not the stray dogs and the free roaming dogs. So is it scientific or is it some something else? No. So technically, all of all dogs which are not under human supervision, whose breeding is not controlled by humans, are supposed to be called free ranging. So again, technically, stray is a technical term. So we call them stray dogs, but a stray is technically an animal which has run away from captivity. So which has an immediate experience of captivity and it has run away, only that is supposed to be stray. So our dogs are not really stray dogs, though we call them stray dogs all the time in colloquial terminology. So adding on to that discussion, Nindida, I, I always uh, kind of like, you know, equate philosophically the racism with uh, the, the pure breed fantasy. You know, people always care, look for like a German shepherd, anything abroad, a Western is uh, something really good breed. While many of our stray animals are begging for the kindness. The Western, Western skin is very good. That is why you should have all the uh, skin lightening creams. It's exactly like that. Um, yes, yes. Frankly, all breeds, where, no matter where they have come from, are products of artificial selection. Whenever we have artificial selection, we have less variation, which is, as anyone who knows a bit of evolution would understand, is not really good. Uh, and artificial breeds, the, all the breeds, because of this uh, phenomenon of artificial breeding, uh, have a lot of difficulty. There are different breeds for which there are different diseases which uh, they suffer from. Uh, uh, they, they are, uh, you know, there are breeds which cannot even give birth naturally and need a C-section, uh, like the English bulldog, apparently. So there are a lot of issues. So if people like having a pet, I always recommend having a dog off the street as a pet because they are meant, uh, they have, you know, survived in this kind of climate. They are adapted to this climate. They can also uh, you know, adapt to uh, life on the streets if needed. 
uh, they learn they need less pampering they need less maintenance so it's always better if you would like to take a pet take one of the street and uh, have it at home adding on to the discussion that kiran the same person from uh, reva university in bangalore uh, that kiran is really active lots of questions so one of uh, the kiran's question is that do the dogs have depression and another question is that uh, can dogs sense earthquakes <laughs> yes it probably can sense earthquakes much better than us because uh, of their heightened sense of uh, hearing uh, so they probably sense the tremors coming earlier than we do uh, many animals actually do that we know that they they will try to run outside when there's an earthquake coming even before we understand what's happening and they will show uh, an, uh, anxiety depression there are a lot of uh, people in the western world who treat dogs uh, for depression uh, and anxiety frankly i don't know because we cannot really get into their heads but uh, i have found it really funny sometimes because i have given talks abroad when they have said oh you know the dog i had on my last slide uh, i that's a very cute picture i like and we are used to seeing dogs licking their noses like that right i mean when i showed you this picture i'm sure none of you thought this picture is odd but when i showed a, a, a similar picture in a talk in uh, amsterdam they told me oh this dog is depressed i said how do you know oh it's licking its nose i was like yeah i mean what's wrong with the dog licking its nose no that's a sign of depression for dogs i was so surprised that why will a dog not lick its nose i mean the nose is something that they need to keep clean all the time and uh, they would be licking their nose clean uh, quite often and they said no it's a sign of depression so whether they are depressed we don't know but of course what we know is you know there's a beautiful book called animal madness and uh, this is a book where uh, they talk about various kinds of captive animals and uh, signs of depression stories where pet owners and uh, have come across situations which have been very difficult because now this might be a phenomena of captive organisms if i uh, was taken to somebody else's house and kept captive and not allowed to meet my family i would be depressed so i don't know whether this is something that only happens in pets so it's good that uh, we don't know too much about the sign of the depression but all of us know the sign of excitement of the dogs actually they yeah, are excitement yeah. i think we all know <laughs> so my question is that uh, you as you discuss earlier the early phase of the puppies is very good for learning so many things from the you can say their mother actually so what is the exact age of the puppy for the adaptation yes so uh, often what i have heard is uh, breeders will give puppies away at 6 weeks or 8 weeks which is actually a very critical time in their development and not a good time to separate them for the mothers i would say not before 3 months uh problem is again this window you know uh, around 3 uh, to 4 months 5 months is when they are actively learning now if you want to really train them then if you take them from the mothers at 4 months they might have actually lost some of the learning window but definitely up to 3 months they need their mothers they need us so a question coming from <coughs> yes yes vinay go ahead yeah. you know very well uh, our, our human civilization these are the early domesticated animals and even in this uh, dog species some species are not uh, you can say domesticated some are very you can say uh, vociferous species within the dogs also so why only few species are domesticated in the dog while other varieties of the dog are not even allowed to come in the matlab civilization civil societies actually they are very vociferous well, so actually, what is the actually depends on what these? you are as thinking in terms of domestication the standard theory that we have right now is all dogs have undergone domestication from their wild uh, wolf like ancestor and uh, any do dog that we see today is an output of domestication but then after domestication uh, whether they have been made into pets they have been uh, you know bred uh, to to give rise to the different breeds or they have uh, remained as free ranging species is the difference now if you go for example if you look at dogs in the mountains in the himalayan regions you would see that dogs of course are different uh, uh, in the terms of their morphology because of the weather but also behaviorally uh, these dogs uh, 
would typically be hanging around in the villages, but then many of these dogs would be taken in as pets, as shepherd dogs by the uh, people, but they are also let, uh, allowed to roam free in the winters when they are not herding anymore and then they will go and hunt. So there are behavioral shifts which happen with, within the lifetime of this individual every year, which would probably influence their overall behavior. Uh, yes, I mean, it's a very interesting discussion. Then uh, you recited one interesting book. So I also have a, a memory of uh, childhood. One of my favorite book is by James Herriot. He has written lots of books on, uh, you know, the pets and dogs and the cats and all, all those. Yes, and terses, all creatures, great and small. So, yes. And uh, yeah, this one is a question is coming from, yes, uh, adding on to the earlier discussion that about the dogs, the, you know, the depression in dogs. So it's a reverse question coming from Iqbal Kaur. Uh, her question is vitamin P that increases the health and longevity of man is nothing but the effect of pet into their life. Are there any studies where dog is proposed as a possible solution for depression in human being? Lots. So there is again a lot of work going on uh, in uh, Europe and US where dogs are being used for therapy. Uh, we know that dogs are very good companions for people who are, uh, you know, who have undergone uh, depression or are, are living in isolation. So they have uh, been proposed as companions for especially, you know, war veterinarians uh, who have uh, traumatic experiences. So there are, there are, uh, so there are a completely set of uh, different people in psychology who really try to use dogs as therapists. So dogs as companion animals for therapy is a completely different field of research. So as you discuss about the selection of the different, you can say, uh, free ranging dogs. So do you identify some pockets from where you collect the data or you are randomly collect the data from the city? So we try to go to all kinds of places for depending on the design of the experiment. So experiments which need long-term observations on a particular group, we try to do outside our campus and neighboring areas so that it's easier to go and do it every day. But for experiments where we are you know, using random dogs for the set of experiments that I showed about pointing and uh, scavenging, where we want to use a separate dog for every experiment, we go to, so for example, we'll go to one neighborhood today, do the tests on 10 different dogs, never go back to that neighborhood for the same experiment again. Go to a different neighborhood tomorrow. So right now we are uh, finishing one project uh, where we are, part of which is the flux, human flux data that I showed you, where my students have gone and worked in nine different country, uh, nine different cities in India, uh, spread over, uh, you know, from uh, Hardwar to Bangalore. And uh, 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 so we, we have actually got uh, data from different areas, trying to understand the effect of human flux, trying to understand human perception of dogs, how uh, you know the diet of humans in that particular area is going to influence dogs. So that is kind of ongoing work, uh, a part of which is the human flux work that I have presented that actually has data from nine different cities in the uh, country. So is there any role of the male partner during the dense selection? During the dense selection, no. It's only the female who does that. So female female try to find out the dense selection within its own territories or can also go from outside the territory? It is within the territory, but we have also had instances where pregnant females have gone and founded new territories. Okay, so Rashmita Luha from uh, Orisha, she's asking a question. A stranger domestic uh, dogs are threatening the endangered species worldwide. How do you compact this problem and in a sustainable manner? Yeah, that's always a problem when you have uh, two species which are in conflict and you want to conserve both species. I think this is not just about dogs. This is about you know standard problems of uh, conservation that we encounter. And again, uh, my understanding of the situation is that dogs are becoming a threat to wilder species simply because humans are encroaching into wildlife habitats because dogs just follow humans. And then in habitats where there is conflict, it's basically there aren't enough resources and the dogs are going and hunting. So if the problem again begins with us, 
if we don't encroach on wildlife habitat, dogs don't follow us, they don't come into contact with wildlife. So ideally, we would have to have a buffer zone between you know, wildlife habitat and human habitat. But this is something we have not been able to manage in India for a long time. And yet another question from Ritu Parna Datta from Presidency University in Kolkata. Uh, she is asking about dog microbiomes. Is there any interesting findings uh, recently? The you know some bacteria living on the dogs or some fungus or potential bio applications on it? I don't know. <laughs> Frankly, I don't know. I wouldn't even want to answer that question because I don't have enough information on that. Okay. And you have already covered, uh, you have touched upon the folklore and epics, uh, you know, in the Mahabharata, I, I guess, that uh, in uh, the dog. And uh, can you say some other example where Indian, uh, you know, Muslim or Christian, I mean, uh, irrespective of the religion, where dogs have played, uh, you know, some role in folklore or myths or epics? Um, I don't have data, but this is actually something that you mentioned it's it's very close to my heart and i have uh, been trying to look for books where there would be anecdotes of this kind and not just india worldwide so anyone who can give me anecdotes i'd love, love to compile them uh, because uh, of course in uh, indian mythology we have uh, the name of Sar sarama the dog uh, and then uh, there's this long story about indra and sarama and being cursed and being blessed and very complicated but uh, about uh, dogs in different folklore and more than uh, religious texts, I'm actually very interested in uh, folk stories, you know, uh, mythology, uh, fairy tales, anywhere where dogs feature, because I always think, you know, these kind of stories give you a very good understanding of lifestyles, which you don't get uh, through of course, scientific literature. And anyone who can give me these stories, I would, uh, absolutely love to get them. Oh, excellent. Uh, I, mean, I think we can end this uh, session now. Fantastic. <laughs> really great session. Yes, Vinay? One, one, one second. One question. Yeah. Left, actually, oh, yeah. Side. Go ahead. So, you know, Matla, we heard so many news about the news of the, you can say, dog biting recently. And even in many cases, we saw the, the patient is killed by the dogs by so much uh, vigorous biting. So why dog is too much aggressive sometimes? Very dog good question. Why do dogs get aggressive sometimes? sometimes? I could go on and on on this. Okay, one of the primary reasons why their dogs get aggressive is uh, when there are puppies around and there are very protective mothers and sometimes even protective uh, putative fathers. And uh, inadvertently, we go into their territory where the puppies are, they feel threatened and they come and fight. That's one. Second is, I have often seen dog bites happening because uh, dog, it's the mating season. Dogs are moving between territories. There is already heightened aggression. And there is, you know, some human who comes between uh, these internal dynamics. So often, they are not just, you know, barking and making a lot of noise. But there are some dynamics going on. And we come in between and we get bitten. Uh, and of course, there are situations where there are some dogs who, uh, you know, are problematic uh, who suddenly get into this biting spree, not just because they're rabid, but I don't know, maybe they're stressed too because of some reason. So uh, not that every dog bite happens uh, because of only these three reasons, but in our uh, observations, I must tell you in these 11 years, I have uh, probably seen six dog bites, which is very low. So it's not that dog go around biting people all the time. They typically avoid unfamiliar humans. But when bites happen, these are the main causes that we have seen. Thank you, Anindita, for such a nice explanation of many queries raised by us as well as by the viewers. So it is really something different from all others' presentations, as I told earlier also. And uh, it is really a part of sanitization. You can say for us also, ki we at least aware about the uh, organism yeah, you can say animal, which is also along with us in the cities. So this is one of them. I saw many times now amid the this coronavirus lockdown, I saw many persons uh, came in the road and feed the uh, animals, including the dogs also. Reason is that dogs is also an animal just like us. 
so he also need the love care and uh, everything that we deserve so thank you for touching our you can say very nice nice topic here thank you anindita my pleasure yeah thank you so much uh, anindita it was really wonderful to have you here and yes we have taken some of your time here on uh, uh, this beautiful day uh, you know world environment day and yes it's in the importance of uh, dogs in our urban ecosystem you have summarized very beautifully thank you so much from uh, yes from bottom of my heart yes i wish you a great day and uh... thanks for the invitation once again have a good day all right and our next session will be at 12 uh, uh, not 12 3 3:30 and by professor rk koli so i will all see you at 3:30 so please join us back at 3:30 exactly uh, until then goodbye all